So this takes a second just to get everybody woven into the meeting. So we'll give it a moment to, uh, to settle in and we'll get going. Welcome folks. Cassie, if you wanna put up the slides, that's not a bad thing at all. Oh, there you go, thanks. Perfect. Okay, I think we're almost there. Okay, why don't we get going? Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our quarterly meeting of the Maine Climate Council. My name is David Plum, and I'm helping to facilitate these meetings. Uh, it's wonderful to see everybody's faces uh, to get back together. Um, I'm going to quickly turn it over to your co-chairs just to say we're doing this as usual on Zoom. Um, and if you have any challenges with that, just send me a quick uh chat inside Zoom and we can get you going on this. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of material today. I'll be giving you a place to offer some notes, some written notes, a Google Sheet. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but let me turn it over to uh, uh, co-chairs uh, to give us an outlook of what we're going to do today. So Director Hannah Pingree, I'll turn to you first. Great. Well, uh, Melanie and I will be um, relatively brief, but just wanted to uh, Good to see you all again. Um, it's been a long time since the, uh, seemingly a long time since the Maine Climate Council met um, compared to our former schedule. Um, I will just say that it's an incredibly exciting and yet chaotic time. Um, so this meeting will be relatively brief, hour and a half, and we're really trying to just keep people in the loop in terms of what's happening. Um, we're gonna organize that today by sector with a number of the leaders of the working groups um, helping to kind of walk through what's happening. Um, I will just say that I think you'll see kind of themes in this and that the Climate Council and the work that we all did and the work that the working groups did, um, you know, culminating in December has really set so many different things in motion in a really exciting way. Um, so I think, I hope that you'll be somewhat gratified, but I hope you'll also realize and see how much is kind of in progress, whether it's legislative bills attempting to work their way through a process, funding proposals before the legislature, obviously lots of activity um, happening in Washington, DC with both federal money that's come to Maine through the rescue plan, as well as other discussions in the, in the big infrastructure jobs bills, uh, lots of things overlapping with climate. So this meeting I think will, will provide you kind of a good snapshot as to where we are, um, but you'll also see a lot of things in progress where the dust has not yet settled. So I do think that as we sort of all come out of this pandemic, hopefully everyone's feeling a little bit more positive about the future. Um, I think it gives us a good chance to really regroup and figure out more actively how is implementation going. And when we get together again in September, I imagine a little bit more digging in by this group, <clears throat> possibly even in person. Um, so I will just say, I think um, kind of one of the big things that was up in the air as we, uh, uh, approve the final climate plan was how are we going to pay for all this? How do we really start, you know, making these things happen with action, which, you know, not everything requires money, but lots of it does require <clears throat> funding. So I think the good news is, um, you know, we didn't completely foresee all of this, but the federal government's uh, American Rescue Plan, um, the governor has now followed that with a main jobs and recovery plan. Um, there's also a governor's bond proposal as well as many other bond proposals that are out there um, in the main legislature. Um, and then there's a new budget package in which the state's revenue picture has improved significantly, allowing us to start making some investments in things that overlap with climate action. So Again, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details because you're going to hear about them from some of our working group co-chairs and leaders, um, but I will just say, you know, everything from significant funding for broadband um, to weatherization to clean energy jobs work, infrastructure adaptation, EV charging, uh, transportation pilots, um, significant funding starting to go into our concept of an adaptation pilot, all of that has been proposed. None of it is finalized. It is all in the uh, legislature's process now. And, and there's lots of, I will say it's a probably pretty chaotic time in a unusual legislative year. Um, I know that Representative Bloom, who's on the phone is currently driving to the 
to Augusta today. The legislature is meeting at 10 a.m. So they are in the middle of a very unusual and busy legislative session with a ton of stuff landing on their plate at the very end. So I will just say we feel optimistic, but nothing is yet final. So again, we're going to hear some specific um, overviews of what's happening in the legislature, what's happening with funding proposals and other works being done by agencies, but also out in the state of Maine. Um, and again, I hope you feel as positive as I do that um, this, this is really, I think, an exciting time where we're starting to see uh, the ability to really take big action. So um, I will pass it off to Melanie, um, who is going to talk a little bit more about actually some very bright signs that we're watching in Washington. Thanks, Hannah. Um, you know, while all of this is happening at the state level and we're uh, figuring out the best ways to apply the federal funding that's coming. The federal government has also been really busy. Uh, so a couple of things that we wanted to highlight this morning. Last month during the Leaders Summit on Climate, President Biden set aggressive goals to achieve at least 50% reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. It's a different twist on the calculation of how we do greenhouse gases, but this goal is in line with Maine's goals and we are on track to meet it. It's really great to have our president challenging the rest of the country to reduce emissions as much as Maine has committed to. And President Biden, fun, has declared that the United States is not waiting either. So it's been uh, wonderful to hear that language at the federal level. Also, with strong support from Maine and other states, EPA has proposed reconsideration of President Trump's withdrawal of the California waiver for vehicle emission standards. And while we're all trying to keep track of legislation, something you should be aware of is that is out for public comment right now until June 6th. Uh, so you can look that up and send comments to EPA until then. Maine has been implementing California's emission standards since 1993. And we do believe that states should be able to use Section 177 of the Clean Air Act to meet our emission goals when federal standards aren't enough. And just this month, EPA proposed its first rule under the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act of 2020 to phase down the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons. EPA is proposing to do this with an allowance trading program to decrease production and import of HFCs into the United States by 85% over the next 15 years. This is going to support our own efforts to prohibit the use of these chemicals and products sold into Maine by driving the market towards safer alternatives. So there is so much that's exciting that's happening both at the state level and the federal level. It's a lot to try to keep up with, but there's lots of opportunities to weigh in as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Great, so what we're gonna be doing is having a set of updates um, that's focused around your climate action plan. And so we're gonna spend the next 50 to 60 minutes going through point by point of the plan and having uh, two kinds of updates, a sort of quick sketch of all across the waterfront, what do we have? And then a, you know, a couple key things that folks wanna um, highlight. It's going to be an, an intense uh, sort of update piece. We're not going to have a lot of conversation around it, but I, I do think it is important if you have questions or comments that we have a place to put those. I've created, as we often do, a Google Doc, and I'm sending it just to the Climate Council members and members of the public. We'll make this public later, but I'm just um, eager to have the, the climate counselors use this. I just put it in the chat right now, and if you click through to that, you'll see it's just a blank uh, form for, to put some comments in as we go. We don't want to lose those thoughts that uh, these presentations trigger in your mind, uh, but we don't have a lot of time to talk, talk about it. All right. So um, unless, Hannah, uh, you have something else you want to say, I'm happy to just jump in. Okay, great. Wonderful. So the, the place we're going to start is actually with Ambassador Dana in talking about the work of uh, your equity uh, subcommittee that was formed right when you launched the, the Climate Action Plan and has been meeting and has been making progress. And so Ambassador Dana, I'll turn it over to you um, to, to give us an update how things are going in, in that work. Sure, thank you, David, and good morning, everybody. Oh, that slide's helpful. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, the uh, equity subcommittee, we are, I think, at 28 members, roughly uh, around 30. And it's a really great group. I, I think we are um, representing everybody that we had identified that should be represented in that uh, equity subcommittee. We, we may be missing some, but, but I think as the work comes, we'll, we'll get those viewpoints organically. Uh, my co-chair, Portland City Councilor Spencer Thibodeau and I have been working with GOPIF um, staff, Jessica Scott and Dr. Cassie. And we've also brought in an outside facilitator, Carol Martin, who's just, uh, you know, everybody's been doing a really fabulous job with the meeting prep and, and the reading materials and uh, running the meeting smoothly. So our basic timeline is that we will um, hopefully be delivering some final recommendations in December of this year. So that puts us in kind of, um, you know, a, a good flow because we there's a, a need to really stick to our schedule and and make sure that we're tackling these topics and and really delivering a, a full viewpoint from everyone in the group on equity as we dive into these working group um, topics. So in February we had our kickoff introductions, getting to know everyone on the council. We are uh, having input and engagement from the members of the legislature, which is great. And then moving into March, we got into some key definitions and some framework for how we want to craft our recommendations. There's been a lot of discussion about environmental justice and kind of what that means to everybody and how we would like to weave that into our work. And that seems to be a really central theme. Another thing everyone is very much on the same page with is, you know, hearing from the frontline communities and being on the ground and and really getting into people's lives and um, experiences as Mainers dealing with the climate crisis from an equity lens. So those discussions have really been um, centered around those themes. And then we started in April looking at the working group topics. So in April, we talked about buildings and weatherization. We brought in a panel. It was a great discussion. And we've kind of hit a place where we're looking at reformatting to get the best uh, information outputted from these meetings. We got to a point where we kind of presented a lot of information and there was, um, you know, some, some fuzzy area around how to best form the recommendations. I, I think people were wondering when to jump in, how to form them. Um, you know, so we're, we're trying to make that process a little less intimidating. So our next meeting coming up Thursday, we're talking about transportation and we'll be utilizing breakout rooms. Um, so to hopefully kind of break these topics up a little bit, have some smaller group discussions and bring back recommendations to, to the larger group. With all that said, I think the recommendations that came out of the April meeting were very good um, and, and some really good material. And the more discussion went on, I think the more recommendations were formed, even if people didn't realize that's what they were doing. So I, I don't believe I've really missed anything. Uh, the process is going really well for us and we're, we're very thankful for all the engagement from the other working groups and the Climate Council leadership. Thanks, Ambassador Dana. I will note that there's, there's a new member of Hannah's team that's supporting your work um, as well, if I'm not mistaken. And right, and so that's great that there's additional capacity in the state to support this subcommittee. Okay, <clears throat> so in the spirit of just keep keeping rolling, I will ask if you have questions for Ambassador Dana or about the work of the subcommittee, please drop them into that Google uh, Doc um, that I, that Google Sheet that I, I put a link in. It also is in your email now because uh, Cassie just sent it off in your email. <clears throat> so in both places, you can click through and, and make some comments. Okay, great. So let's press forward and go into these pieces of your climate action plan. <clears throat> the slide right now, excuse me, <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. The slide walks through what your plan is. And I'm gonna turn it over to Joyce, who's gonna lead us through the first one. And Joyce, could you do us a favor and just remind everyone about the A through H 
and what we have in this climate action plan uh, before you dive into the transportation pieces, because that could be helpful. Yes. Well, particularly if you have a frog in my throat. <laughs> um, thank you, David. Um, I am Joyce Taylor, the Chief Engineer of Maine DOT, and I was the co-chair of the transportation, and still, I should say, the co-chair of the Transportation Working Group. And yes, um, you know, we ended up um, all together, um, all the different working groups presenting to you, the Climate Council, eight different strategies. And we're all going to be going through and um, letting you know what we've been up to and what we've been doing. I'm gonna talk about the first one, which is embrace the future of transportation in Maine. So if we wanna to go to the next slide. So um, Hannah mentioned the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan. I think um, one thing of note that's not in my slides um, to just mention is the 8 million for EV charging. I would say the um, Efficiency Maine Trust with Michael Stoddard leading it has been very busy um, working on RFPs for charging stations. Um, and I think we've had a meeting since they released um, the new rebate programs they have and, and how they really upped the numbers, especially um, it, for the equity lens and nonprofit organizations and government. Um, so they're very, very busy um, and our working group is trying to support them. And I don't know about you, but I hear ads on the, the radio all the time for electric vehicles. So they've been pretty active. Um, we've been spending a lot of our time um, at uh, looking at vehicle miles traveled and how do we change driver behavior, um, change how, where people live, give them opportunities to walk safely and to bike safely, um, which has led Maine DOT to really look at our complete streets program and really be cognizant of the fact that, you know, one of the reasons people drive is they don't feel safe biking or walking. And so how are we going to change um, our projects and how we design and how we build things to really help encourage um, infilling of, of villages and allowing people to have that choice and to feel safe. Um, and we've also all been very busy. Um, GoPIF has put out the clean transportation or the EV roadmap, um, which they expect to have um, results by the end of the year. I'm gonna talk some more about Go Maine and rural transit proposals. Maine DOT also has um, asked you, Maine, Jonathan Rubin, who is um, part of our transportation working group and part of the equity subcommittee. He has, he and his team have done an awesome job um, finally finishing up what I would call the EV equity study, which really was, I think some of you know, Commissioner Van Note was very interested in how um, people who, um, could, could not um, necessarily have reliable transportation, have transportation issues, how we could also um, get them into a more efficient car or um, an electric vehicle. So we have that study, um, which is really, I think more than anything at this point, brought forward some really good best practices from around the country. Um, we also um, have heard loud and clear that, that uh, we need to look at transit here in Maine. Um, the reality is, you know, only 1% of uh, trips to work are really done on transit. So we need to really look at um, drive uh, behavior and I'll, I'll talk about that, but UMaine also did a really good job. Um, a lot of research on transit is urban, it is not rural and we are by far a rural state. And so they came up with some good case studies um, that I'll talk about. And then lead by example, um, the state itself has made a commitment um, that 50% of newly purchased light duty vehicles um, will be ZEVs or, or FEVs by 2025 and 100% by 2030 and will have charging infrastructure. Um, Maine DOT has already gone ahead and as has DEP um, and we've installed level two charger, charging stations at um, at least DOT, all our regional offices as well as headquarters. So if the working group can never meet at DOT again, you're gonna be able to charge a car here, um, which is exciting. And other agencies are now applying to Efficiency Maine um, there's a, to the government program. So we wanna to go to the next slide. Talk about the clean transportation roadmap. Um, they have all read, they are in the process, I believe of reviewing um, the proposals right now. And I think they received a number of them, which was great. And it's really looking at um, 
what do we need for policies and programs and regulatory changes to support the EV goals, the emission reduction goals, and to get stakeholders more involved? So I, I think that's really key. Um, and you know, we need to make um, people really feel like um, an electric vehicle is a good choice for them. And so some of this work is gonna help inform how we go about encouraging people on this path. And you can see the light duty electric vehicle goals. Um, we have you know, a significant way to go for 25 and 2030, but I think if Michael was talking to you right now, he'd be excited about um, how much growth they're beginning to see and how um, it's really across the state that you were beginning to see people purchase electric vehicles. So next slide. So we're gonna talk about the Go Maine program, which is a ride sharing program. And Maine DOT is taking it over from the Maine Turnpike. It really has been a statewide program, but in all honesty, I think it's mostly been sort of a Southern Maine commuting program. And so, you know, really post pandemic and looking at, you know, are people going to still telework? Are people going to have different hours? Are people going to be more flexible, you know, showing up at 10, deciding to leave at four? Um, we really need to think about behavior. What is it going to take to get people to ride, to ride together, especially with a stranger? And so we also want to expand this program so that it's not just looking at the people that you know work at IDEX, that you know, it's 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 really looking at are there cohorts, um, you know, shift work in particular. Do we have, do we get vans where people can go to, you know, um, the potato starch uh, company in Arusta County that needs workers? Um, how do we get folks? who don't have a license but need a job, um, maybe to be able to use GoMain. So we're putting out an RFP. Again, we have a rural focus um, to really see how we can use this program beyond what it's ever been. And we are looking for businesses. Um, when we announce our GoMain 2022, um, we really wanna find you know, five to 10 businesses that uh, maybe have a van program that we can announce when we kick this program off. So um, if anyone's interested or you know of anyone, let us know, um, but we'll be working on that. The RFP is to be uh, released very shortly. So next slide. So um, we have, we at DOT are spending um, a huge amount of time talking about transit and in particular rural transit. You can see we've got a number of transit providers in the state um, and you know, there are a couple electric buses coming. Um, we're still waiting for them. They are late. The bus companies are having a hard time um, with production. But we really know um, that we need to look at rural transit. And again, how do you get people to want to share a ride? How do you get people um, to want to take advantage of this service? So um, again, UMaine did a white paper on this topic. And it was really interesting. There's some, there are some good examples. Um, we've touched base. Georgia DOT just started a new program. Vermont is doing a lot of interesting things, um, in particular working on um, how to get people in recovery to their doctor's appointments or their, their recovery appointments, as well as to work. Um, and so we've been, we've been really trying to find those good practices. So the other thing that we need to do is really focus on, you know, in urban, you want to focus on the routes and what's the best vehicle type for that route? What's the best bus so that we can look at how do we transition to electric vehicles? And maybe it's not just the huge bus, maybe it's the smaller buses and you do more frequent routes. Um, so we've, we've contacted like 16 transit um, agencies that are using electric buses and sort of done a download with them on routing and how they route. And so we're also looking at maybe a, a subset of the RFP being a different RFP to look at um, a couple of the urban groups as pilots and to look at the, the routing and what they what those agencies are gonna need for charging setup and what they need for vehicles. Um, so that's, that's going on. And then um, I think in terms of equitable transportation and looking at, you know, how to get folks reliable transportation, um, 
beyond just work to medical appointments, to the grocery store, to be able to get out for folks who can't drive, um, for folks who don't have reliable vehicles. Um, I think that there's a lot of synergy opportunities um, with some of the other um, departments, including um, DHHS and DOL and DECD. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously DOL and DHHS have been extremely busy <laughs> during the pandemic. So what we are doing at DOT is compiling a list of all the best practices between some of the equity ideas, the transit ideas, so that um, Commissioner Van Note can share with um, his fellow commissioners of those agencies and really have a high level discussion and a commitment um, to working together um, to achieve both climate goals and some synergy in terms of um, transit needs. So that's what's been going on. Uh, it's, it's been very busy. Um, a lot of activity, you'll start to see it more publicly, I think once the RFPs get out. Um, but happy to answer any questions when it's time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joyce. That's great. How encouraging. Again, folks, if you can use that Google Sheet to uh, drop in notes, I see some folks are doing that. Thanks so much. Um, speaking of busy, um, let's turn to uh, Michael Stoddard to talk about buildings. And um, Michael, take it away, please. Thanks, David. Uh, and uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things um, that, are, that comprise this update. One is funding, two is policy discussions, and three is program implementation. Um, the first part of that is funding, and Hannah referenced it as something that was on all of our minds as we were coming out of the planning process and wondering where the funds were going to come from to do uh, all the great ideas that we had in there. Um, and I've listed here the uh, funds from the federal programs that we uh, know are coming our way and that the governor has indicated would be um, th the way she'd like to see it allocated. And so within that, there was $50 million uh, targeted for energy efficiency generally, which breaks out to 25 million for weatherization of uh, residential homes. And then um, $15 million for uh, local government and schools and community organizations. And then another $10 million for industry and business. And um, I think you could imagine that most of those kind, most of that funding would go to the kinds of things that Efficiency Maine now runs programs for, whether it's uh, insulation and air sealing or uh, high efficiency heating systems and water heating systems. And in the cases of industry and business, um, more kinds of mechanical devices, refrigeration systems, things like that. So it's stuff that's pretty well known to us what the targets are. And it's really, really nice to think that we might have some additional funding to bump up the, the program activity. So I think that would really give us a couple of years, a uh, great jump start in those areas. Um, another 50 million is referenced for affordable housing. And uh, I think every time we think of procuring um, public housing or affordable housing, we want to make sure that those homes are built to uh, high efficiency standards and these funds would help us do that. And then third, there was reference to another $50 million for heritage industries. Um, and that includes use of forest products uh, and, and an emphasis on use of low carbon uh, content materials. So we think about things like mass timber and uh, biomass based products like insulation products and things like that. So um, really exciting news on that front. I neglected to add a couple of other sources of funding that have come our way since we all uh, finished our planning process. One of those is um, some more Volkswagen funds have been allocated from a, from a settlement a, against Volkswagen to do some of the work that we um, have, have put in our, in our recommendations from uh, Strategy B, and then also some funds from the settlement of the New England Clean Energy Connect transmission line case. Um, and it's, it's really significant funding, so I think it's worth mentioning um, they agreed to pay $15 million for heat pumps, most of which is going for low and moderate income households, 10 million for EV chargers, 5 million for EV rebates, 
and another two and a half million dollars over the next two years for low income uh, home uh, improvements like weatherization. So those settlements are really timely and helping us get going. Next slide, please. So that's the update on the funding. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the policy work, but uh, this is a list of what I could think of. I think these are just the ones that I've testified on. Um, so that means there are a lot more than this, but you can see there's been quite a bit of attention to figuring out how we might secure more funding for the recommendations that were in the Climate Action Plan and also how to codify the targets and the goals and the strategies that are referenced in the plan. And that's what a lot of these bills are doing. Um, there's been pretty solid progress and I think good momentum behind some of the financing bills like the CPACE bill, I think got a very strong vote out of committee. There's been really solid testimony about Green Bank and a, a couple of different ways that we could go on that, but a, a lot of support generally for that. Um, and then uh, discussion around bonds and, um, and also codifying the goals, as I mentioned for weatherization. Next slide, please. And um, there, there was also a bill in the natural Res uh, Environment and Natural Resource Committee about uh, regulating HFCs, um, which not only show up in um, refrigerants, which are what flow through the course through the veins of all heat pump technology and all refrigeration and freezer systems, which is a big deal, but also is used in a lot of insulation products. So that matters uh, for all of the recommendations we had about building and building products and, and um, weatherization. And then um, I, I didn't wanna miss mentioning that on the regulation front, the MUBEC technical board, which is responsible for the building codes has made progress in adopting the most recent round, the most recent editions of the um, International Energy Conservation Code. So we're making progress there. Next slide, please. Um, lead by example was one of the recommendations from this group. And we were thinking particularly about state buildings and state procurement and use of state funds. Um, before we uh, even finished our work, obviously the governor had issued executive order 13, which kind of got the ball rolling that we would be looking at lead by example opportunities. And uh, then in um, just this spring, um, go, Hannah's office and, and Dan Burgess office came out with the lead by example report, which did a really nice job of sort of enumerating what the most promising opportunities were and setting some targets. And they're all very similar and, and, and draw nice parallels to what the recommendations were in the um, plan that we've all generated. Um, and then finally, we've been getting to work on some of those things. One is upgrading state buildings. We're taking some of those VW settlement funds and working with BGS to uh, find good projects in state buildings where we can upgrade the building envelope and the heating and cooling systems. And we've gotten started on that work. And then also on the affordable housing front, we uh, have been partnering with Maine Housing and in their most recent crop of proposals to uh, get the affordable housing tax credit, we offered an incentive to get people to build to passive house standard. And we have at least six of those projects that are very seriously considering it. Next slide, please. And then last but not least, um, I won't go through all of these, but we've been working our little tails off at Efficiency Maine to just do our day job, which is implementing these programs. So heat pumps have gone uh, gangbusters notwithstanding the disruptions from COVID. And I think we are gonna, I, I know we're going to exceed 20,000 units this year alone. And that actually is on the track to the very ambitious targets that we set in the plan for 2025 and 2030. Um, when people around the country see this, they shake their heads and say, how are you guys doing it? Um, they're really impressed. And I think everyone should be proud of the progress we're making in this state on that. Um, we are similarly doing really well on heat pump water heaters and uh, we have a pellet boiler initiative going. Uh, we have discontinued offering incentives on oil and propane systems. Um, I mentioned the affordable housing and we're cranking along on weatherization. It has not been going great for weatherization this year. The COVID um, challenges really made it hard to get into people's homes on the inside, and that's totally understandable. So I'm really hoping for a better year ahead, but 
um, some of this workforce development work that um, that we can do with the ARP funds is going to help a lot. That's it. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Um, all right. Um, so next up, we have Dan Burgess going to uh, uh, talk to uh, going to talk to us about the energy pieces. So, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, David. And good morning, everyone. Great, great to be with you. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk briefly about um, uh, strategy C, reducing carbon emissions in Maine's energy and industrial sectors. Um, you know, a big um, component of that was, you know, as as we uh, do more electric vehicles, uh, as we do more in um, the electrification of the of the heating sector, we need to make sure that we have the uh, clean and renewable resources uh, uh, to supply um, the, that strategic electrification. As this group knows, it, Maine has a requirement for 80% of our um, energy to come from renewable resources, and that is done through the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Uh, so we are at 80%. We will be at 80% by 2030. Um, uh, and one of the ways in which we are uh, ensuring that we're going to reach those targets is through um, going out for uh, uh, contracts for large-scale utility um, or, or uh, utility-scale resources. So these are larger-scale renewable energy resources. And I, I just note that we've made progress in that. Um, uh, last last summer, the first tranche of those procurements for about 10% of Maine's electric load was was awarded. And the PUC um, uh, uh, is currently reviewing bids for the second tranche of those of those uh, uh, procurement targets for about four and a half to five percent of Maine's load. So we're looking at um, through these through these procurements adding significant amounts of renewable energy resources to Maine's electric grid in the coming years, which is well well in line with strategy C. I will note that as, as Michael and others have mentioned, it's a busy time in the legislative um, session and there are a number of bills related to uh, the RPS and renewable uh, uh, additions and renewable policy generally legislation related to offshore wind and the proposed research array that, that the administration has been working on um, just earlier this week there was um, legislation to consider uh, uh, procurement of a transmission line to unlock some northern main resources there's been ongoing work with regards to solar and net metering policy uh, as well as things like energy storage rate design um, and, and others so it's a it's been a busy time, and so those are some of the topics that um, we'll be, I'm sure, at our next uh, quarterly meeting, we'll be providing a summary and update of, of where things ultimately landed. Next slide. So uh, when we released the, the Climate Action Plan, one of the things that was made mention of is that our office was required to conduct an assessment of how we meet that 80% by 2030 target. Um, and we uh, released that earlier this year. It is the Renewable Energy Goals Market Assessment. Um, and so I, I won't go into all the details of, of uh, what was in this lengthy report done by some, uh, a great consultant group that we hired. But uh, the overall takeaway is that Maine is on track to, to meet our, our 2030 targets. Uh, in particular, we have planned or uh, have enough resources to meet our goals leading up to about 2026. Um, but as we get to the later half of the decade, we'll need to add more uh, renewable resources in order to meet that 80% target. Uh, transmission is going to play a key key role in uh, unlocking some of the resources that are, are, are facing constraints. Storage, energy storage can play a really vital role, a crucial role in um, helping us meet those targets. We should work uh, uh, regionally, and we should make sure that we prioritize equity um, as well as a diverse portfolio. There's a lot that, that, that go with all those things, but uh, I think it's in line with a lot of the, the findings of the Climate Action Plan. I um, mean, it's, it's great to have this additional analysis that shows okay, what steps we need to take and what policies do we need to look at to ensure that we meet our, our RPS by 2030. Next, next slide. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this, except for we just to note that we had the consultants run six different modeling scenarios that looked at what uh, different portfolios could look like for how we how we get to 2030. We need to add somewhere in the range of 800 to 900 megawatts of new new renewable energy resources, and they could come from 
um, a, a different mix of, of resources depending on policies that are put in place over the next over the next few years. Next slide. So finally, uh, as we look at um, you know uh, growing the uh, clean energy economy as laid out in, in strategy D, it's made some mention of it earlier, but did want to kind of I did want to highlight a proposal that uh, was put forward in the in the ARP plan. Uh, something that is called the Clean Energy Partnership, and so this is uh, this is going to be an effort that um, prioritizes uh, two main components. Uh, it's a public-private partnership that is going to be focused on advancing workforce, uh, the clean energy workforce, on uh, one component, and the other component is is uh, around clean energy and uh, climate innovation. So supporting kind of the uh, innovation uh, of the of within the clean energy economy. Uh, we're doing some initial work uh, already. The governor announced half a million dollars with MTI to do a clean energy uh, challenge. We're supporting startups and, and, and new ideas in the space. Um, but really, this effort will be um, yeah, uh, programming and partnerships to be focused on uh, um, you know, uh, sector-specific workforce opportunities and training programs and um, opportunities to advance innovation. And so a lot more to come on this, but it's, a, an, it's an exciting sector-specific effort that uh, uh, we're hopeful that can match the clean energy policies we have with the workforce and innovation needed to um, to strengthen them and, and back them up. So with that, David, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dan. Um, and to keep going with strategy D around growing the Maine's clean energy economy, uh, Commissioner Am Amanda Beal will talk about natural resource industries. So Commissioner Beal, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're great. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I guess I'll just give you a disclaimer up front here. I'm going, I'm going to talk about um, strategy D and strategy E, but I really feel like this is not a comprehensive update of everything that's going on uh, related to these strategies. It's just sort of a tip of the iceberg kind of an update. Um, and so related to strategy D, uh, we're, we're of course excited about the governor's um, proposed allocation of $50 million towards investments in our heritage industries related to agriculture, fisheries, and forestry in the main jobs and recovery plan. And I know Michael talked a little bit about the forestry piece earlier, um, but the way that that breaks down is 20 million for um, agriculture infrastructure and processing um, and uh, 10 million for seafood and 20 million for forest products and manufacturing. And we know that all of these sectors are really critical to our natural resource-based economy. And they're all, they can all help us get to our climate action plan goals of building a local, uh, building a stronger local food system uh, and encouraging innovation in climate-friendly forest products, as well as providing numerous other benefits. And I also just wanted to mention a collaborative effort by the Department of Economic and Community Development and Department of Marine Resources and uh, my department, uh, Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, which is that we recently conducted a heritage industries infrastructure survey to help us to understand what needs and opportunities exist and what levels of investment would be most meaningful for businesses in these sectors. And so this really, positions us well to, um, you know, distribute those kind, that kind of funding um, as, as uh, mentioned in the main jobs and recovery plan um, and have real data to help guide those decisions. Um, next slide. So some updates relevant to strategy E include the inclusion of the recommended $20 million investment to bolster fisheries and wildlife and $16 million to support needed actions in our fisheries industry, uh, also in the main jobs and recovery plan and taken together, uh, those funds will help to do a number of things, including uh, updating means hatcheries and allowing for investment in numerous climate resiliency activities. And of course, there's a lot more detail on this in the governor's plan. Um, and then in terms of the governor's bond package, which proposes $40 million for the Lands for Maine Future program, uh, as we all know, LMF is the state's primary funding vehicle for conserving land for its natural and recreational value, protecting farmland, working forest land, and our working waterfronts. 
And as noted in the state's climate action plan, we are losing land to development at a rate of approximately 10,000 acres per year. And that development pressure is only expected to grow. So funding LMF is really integral to meeting our goals to maximize our uh, sequestration of carbon and uh, losing land to development will impede our ability to meet those goals. And I'll also acknowledge that there are two other LMF related bills uh, in, in the legislature by Senator Breen and Representative Corey. And I just I want to mention that because we really appreciate their support for this important program as well. And then on the legislative front, I'll mention two specific bills that are in alignment with our work and uh, in particular with the Natural Working Lands recommendations. There's LD 437, which is an act to establish the Maine Healthy Soils Program. And that's sponsored by Senator Brenner and co-sponsored by Representative Osher and others. And this directs uh, DACF to establish a Maine Healthy Soils Program to provide information to farmers on the benefits of soil health practices, peer learning opportunities and sources of financial assistance, promote and incentivize soil health incentives, uh, soil health incentives, enhance other state and federal soil health programs and provide incentives to beginning and uh, socially disadvantaged farmers. And the other bill I'll highlight is LD-937. This is a, a soil carbon storage bill um, uh, sponsored by Representative Osher. And ultimately it directs DACF and IFNW to convene a stakeholder process or stakeholder group to recommend programs, policies, and financial incentives that uh, will enhance carbon se sequestration in soils. So we'll plan to start this work later this year. Um, and I'm sure uh, some of you may get tapped to be on that stakeholder group. So stay tuned. Um, and this would require, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't lose my place. Um, and this will require us to report back to the legislature with a preliminary report in March of 2022 and wrapping up with recommendations by September of 2022. Um, and then I'll mention two state agency updates uh, related to um, strategy E 1.2 conserve high biodiversity areas. Uh, uh, IFNW, uh, Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry and, and um, Department of Marine Resources and conservation partners have worked together to update Maine's focus areas of statewide ecological significance to include new at-risk species occurrences, resilient landscapes, and aquatic features. And there will be work in the coming months taking place to review these areas and identify opportunities for integrating them into conservation funding, technical assistance management, and other land conservation and incentive strategies. And as for outcome, um, E 3.1 and F also relates to F 1.1, technical assistance for natural and working lands and robust communities. Uh, IFNW's beginning with habitat program is working with staff and partners to bring new climate adaptation and resilience information into the technical assistance packages that they provide to towns, land trusts and landowners. And later this summer, they'll be adding a climate change toolbox to their online natural resource mapping tools to include marsh migration information from the Maine Natural Area Areas Program, as well as resilient and connected landscapes and forest carbon information from the Nature Conservancy. And uh, so there are a few other specific in, uh, initiatives that I'm gonna just spend a few minutes talking about on the next couple of slides. So if we could go to the next, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so the Forest Carbon Program Task Force, uh, um, so this is a task force that was recommended uh, to be established in the Climate Action Plan, and the governor did this by executive order earlier, earlier this year. Um, and the charge is, as you see here, to develop a voluntary program for small to medium-sized woodland owners in Maine who want to utilize their land for long-term storage of carbon. I will say that um, the, the landscape of carbon programs is really evolving and changing rapidly. And so, um, you know, what this group is ultimately doing is considering what the best role is for the state, whether that means developing a program or working to help landowners access existing programs and that all is still to be determined. Uh, so I am co-chairing this task force along with Tom Odello from the governor's office. Uh, it has 15 members. We've met four times to date since February. We're meeting approximately monthly. And uh, we are, I think, on track to do our work and report back to the governor by September 1st of this year. 
And of course, all meetings are public and recorded and you can, you can access all of that if you're interested. Um, next slide. Uh, there's also an agricultural solar siting stakeholder group that is about to launch. And this, um, the work of this group relates to one of the climate action plan recommendations to develop policies by 2022 to ensure renewable energy project siting is streamlined and, and transparent while seeking to minimize impacts on natural working lands and engaging key stakeholders. So really, uh, you know, we're starting with agricultural lands here because that's really where the greatest pressure is right now. Uh, and I, I have no doubt that there will need to be some further discussion about uh, impacts and, and to make recommendations for other kinds of uh, lands as well. Uh, but this is uh, being co-chaired at this point by Nancy McBrady, who's the director of um, our department, DACF's uh, Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources, as well as Selena Cunningham from the um, Governor's Energy Office. And this group has about 16 members. Their first meeting is going to be on June 3rd. Um, and they'll be meeting about a half a dozen times or so between then and the end of the year to report back to the legislature in December. And again, these meetings will be public and accessible. Uh, next slide. Uh, and finally, I wanted to mention, uh, there has been a, a natural resource interagency climate action plan work group that was formed. Uh, they began meeting in last December and it includes lead staff from DEP, DMR, um, IFNW and DACF. And we were really interested in, um, you know, maximizing the efficiency and effectiveness of our agencies to address and implement um, recommendations from the Climate Action Plan. And we have, um, you know, paying particular focus on existing programs and also just interested in breaking down silos and harnessing the power of collaboration between our agencies. And so we have uh, representative staff from all four of these agencies on this work group. And uh, I'll just mention our lead staff, um, for each agency are Nate Robbins at DEP, Molly Dougherty from DACF, Kathleen Layden from DMR, and Amanda Cross from IFNW. And they've been doing a lot of great work. Uh, to date, they've identified 20, 24 outcomes in the Climate Action Plan most relevant to our respective agencies. And um, they have outlined the steps and essential collaborations needed to implement each. So that's going to really help us to do our part um, in a coordinated way. Uh, and finally, I just want to mention, like I said, this is absolutely not an exhaustive <laughs> list of things that are happening. And we know that uh, many other, uh, you know, many other activities are underway, both in and outside of state government, you know, such as Maine Audubon is working with Maine Farmland Trust and others to identify areas for renewable energy development that minimize its impacts on natural and working lands. We know there's research going on at the University of Maine on important things like biochar and soil carbon storage, as well as dual use center, solar energy generation technology alongside wild blueberry production and land trusts and community partners working on land conservation projects and much, much more. So I think all of this adds up to a whole lot of momentum and energy, which is really exciting. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. That's fantastic. <clears throat> Just incredible. Everything is going on. Okay, let's go on to Resilient Communities, which is our strategy F. And here, Judy East, uh, who helped co-chair, um, is going to tell us what's going on. So, Judy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so, I'll describe uh, some of the implementation measures uh, towards strategy F, building healthy and resilient communities. Um, I'll pass the baton to um, Commissioner Loisum to discuss the uh, sea level rise bill, and I'll give you some more detail in a moment about the GOPIF community resilience pilot. Um, but to touch on some of the uh, funding issues with this slide, um, I want to point out that the um, main jobs and recovery plan has proposed that the American recovery plan funding uh, provide money into the drinking water and wastewater uh, state revolving loan funds to the tune of $25 million each. Um, also, the governor's supplemental budget does recommend at this point $5.5 for technical assistance 
uh, incentives, grants, and so on to further municipal uh, and regional resilience planning and clean energy projects. Uh, again, as you heard before, this isn't uh, complete yet, but these are all the proposals. Um, and uh, I'll be meeting actually later today with uh, Rebecca Lincoln to discuss a proposal uh, that Maine CDC is putting forward for building resilience uh, against climate effects for a grant proposal um, that's pending. So um, I'm going to pass the baton to Commissioner Loisem uh, to talk about LD 1572, and then I'll come back with the uh, GOPIC pilot. Thanks, Judy. Um, so as many of you are aware, this was uh, implementation of the recommendation by the Science and Technical Subcommittee and by the Climate Council at large to pursue um, management and planning for sea level rise. Uh, the governor asked Representative Bloom to uh, introduce this bill uh, and the Environment and Natural Resources Committee recently, Friday, I believe, uh, gave it a majority vote in support. So we are uh, expecting that this will be successful in front of the full legislature as well. The importance of this resolve uh, is not to set a blanket standard for sea level rise because we don't need legislation necessarily to do that. And it's a bit more complicated than that for all of us to implement it throughout the variety of programs and policies where this needs to be considered. So this resolve recognizes that that's the work of the state agencies that needs to happen in conjunction with all of our stakeholders and directs us to report back to the legislature any changes to law that would be necessary that we discover as a result of that work. As Commissioner Beal mentioned, we already have staff from the various natural resource agencies who've been evaluating our regulations and our policies already looking ahead to including this um, into the work that we do. So this Resolve is important to support that work. And as I've said to others um, regarding this bill, this sort of plants the flag for us. You know, the Science and Technical Subcommittee did a lot of really good bipartisan work to establish those numbers. And there's a lot more work to be done to figure out how to implement it. And it's not productive for us to continue to debate, debate those numbers anymore when we've got uh, such strong scientific support for them. And with that, I'll hand it back to Director East. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so let's see, this is the, the GOPIF Community Resilience Pilot. Um, so this is funding, uh, private funding that was, an RFP was issued a couple of months ago, purpose being to advance uh, resilience planning and implementation to um, uh, award uh, to providers who can demonstrate replicable and engagement models to assist individual communities and groups of communities, and also to inform future development in support of resilience. Um, three providers uh, were chosen, um, representing cohorts that provided, um, that will provide uh, demonstrable models in um, First, uh, coastal communities. So that was the University of Southern Maine with uh, three coastal communities there listed. Uh, GP Cog as well was, that was a combination of coastal and inland. And then Northern Maine Development Commission in association, collaboration with the Nature Conservancy are, is uh, working with multiple communities. That's a couple of them shown there. Um, for inland communities. So the, the purpose here is uh, really to provide um, pilot uh, demonstrable models that can be transferable to other communities around the state. Um, so the uh, launch of these projects was literally yesterday. They'll work through the spring and summer and then have the opportunity to apply in the fall for implementation funding, depending on the specific uh, work products that are proposed with the community outreach. So we had very um, strong proposals here. Um, so more coming on that one uh, in the days to come. And then if the 5.5 million is, is approved in the governor's supplemental, I, I can see this really blossoming to a lot of other projects. Uh, so next slide, please. This one is the next strategy, the investment in climate ready infrastructure. Recall this was the one proposal by the emergency management subgroup of the resilience group to create uh, the infrastructure 
um, adaptation fund. And um, so the governor has proposed it through the American Rescue Plan to uh, put $20 million into that adaptation fund, and it would support uh, local, regional, and state infrastructure projects uh, to address, address our vulnerabilities and protect vital infrastructure. I believe the first uh, set of initiatives will focus very much on sea level rise, um, uh, vulnerabilities, and transportation infrastructure. And this fund will be housed at Main DOT, um, where they will also use uh, some of it I don't know all those details, but certainly to uh, initiate this transportation infrastructure vulnerability assessment, which was one of the prime strategies um, from the transportation working group. Um, and I think those are all of my slides. I, it, the, I can pass the baton now to Cassie and Tony. Thanks, Judy. Perfect. So Tony, Cassie, um, you were gonna walk us through the strategy H, which is around engagement and communication. So I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. Um, good to see everybody again. Um, in lieu of a, a long communications report, there is a, um, you know, here verbally, there is a, a detailed communications report for everybody in your packet. Happy to take any feedback or questions on that. I tried to be as inclusive as possible as everything we've done since February. And uh, it was quite a bit. Uh, once I was able to put it all together. Um, the other update I wanted to give for, uh, for folks is that we are continuing to work on sort of the KPI key performance indicators tracking project. Um, we're still gonna work on that throughout the summer and I should have a more, uh, a bigger update on that uh, in the fall. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, a RFP for communication services for the Maine Climate Council um, is out. It went out in early May and is due back um, uh, here, I think on May 27th, we should see the first responses. I'll go into detail about that a little bit later, but uh, it is a major update for, for our work. Um, as far as strategy H initiatives go and implementation, the main climate core um, went through as a resolve in LD 722. Um, it is pending enactment. Um, and so that is, uh, that's a, bi a big win for, um, for strategy H to see, that, uh, to see that sail through pretty well. Um, and then I'm going to pass it to Dr. Cassie. She's going to take us through sort of the climate education updates uh, with the Department of Education and give a quick look at our new climate science dashboard, which launched on Earth Day. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you and welcome to our observers as well. So I'm very happy to share a few updates from the Maine Department of Education on implementing Strategy H. DOE has developed a number of climate and environmental science related online modules through their Moose Education online platform this last year. And they are planning a climate education Moose series later this year as well. They have also launched a climate education webinar series for Maine K-12 educators, which is going to be ongoing through the summer. They've had a couple of webinars so far. In addition, they are collecting a number of educate, climate education examples from around the state, which they will be highlighting on their science and climate education webpage um, beginning soon as a showcase of examples. Um, they are partnering with the Governor's Energy Office and GOPIF on a strategic plan for climate and clean energy workforce. Um, working through their career and technical education team in particular. And last but not least, they're also working on school bus and building electrification and energy improvements um, through um, electrification of their building heating, building and water heating, um, and improving efficiency. So quite a few um, initiatives on many fronts going on there as well. And I know that they are planning more uh, work throughout the year. So I'm thrilled to share the main climate science dashboard. This is something that we promised to you in our first meeting earlier this year and was launched last month on Earth Day. <clears throat> this new tool from um, our office and the science in partnership with many members of the scientific and technical subcommittee and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and <clears throat> uh, Climate Council alumnus, mem alumnus um, Andy Pershing um, was put together 
to showcase historical data and future projections on three main climate science variables or climate trackers, um, land temperatures, ocean temperatures, and sea level rise. GOPIF was lucky to receive a small grant from the US Climate Alliance to help facilitate this work. Um, so we'd like to thank them as well. So this dashboard lets you explore historical data um, interactively over time and uh, do comparisons against historical data and three different future scenarios. The scenarios are dependent on the trajectory of future greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so please, if you haven't checked this out yet, take a look, let us know what you think. We're really excited for this to be a communications tool as well as an educational tool. So with that, we're gonna move forward and I'll hand it back to Tony. Thank you, Cassie. I, um, uh, Dr. Rose did an amazing amount of work to get that climate science dashboard uh, in a position to, to launch. And so major kudos to her for all, um, uh, for all that effort. Um, last thing for everybody on communications is again, is the RFP. Um, the responses are due, as I mentioned, May 27th. Um, and this is generally the, the direction of the RFP that we wanna go. It's, it's um, uh, to give us capacity to do um, targeted awareness and understanding initiatives about climate change in Maine and about our climate response initiatives, um, help promote opportunities for action through climate related uh, programs and initiatives. Um, so really highlighting what people can do to sh so it's not just raising awareness about what is happening, but also trying to uh, galvanize or catalyze that into action for folks. Um, um, Michael Stoddard, I want you to know I have taken advantage of this, and I have a brand new heat pump hot water heater in my basement, so I'm part of your of your amazing metrics. Um, we also need to highlight uh, people, businesses, and organizations showing leadership on climate action. You know. Um, find those leaders among us, those that we know and those that we don't, that are really, um, really emblematic of what we'd like to see happen more broadly. Um, and also along with what Dr. Rose was talking about, you know, increasing youth and student awareness and engagement on climate and energy topics. Um, key audiences for this, um, youth clearly, the business community, you know, the public writ large, um, municipalities, um, we're going to try to drill down on some targeted work uh, with some of those key audiences to, um, uh, to really uh, keep momentum on the plan. There's been a lot of great discussion about it since it came out in December, um, a lot of activity on climate in the first six months of this year, um, but you know the work needs to continue and this, uh, this RFP is gonna do that. And with that, I think I'm all set. David, back to you. Excellent, okay, wonderful. So there you have it, an hour's worth of updates. Thank you for your patience and listening. <laughs> Clearly there's a lot to share. Um, what we'd like to do now is have more of a conversation, um, and we'd like to structure that conversation around thinking about how you all, as well as climate counselors, are playing a role in the coming months and year in doing this work and in particularly engaging and communicating with folks around this work. So we want to generate a conversation around that. We've got a couple pathways into that conversation. One is... Uh, Tony and Dan Cleveland have something to say about a plan that they're hatching. So I'm going to start there. And then I got a couple questions to kick off a conversation with all of you about what this might look like in terms of you all as climate counselors playing a role in building on this incredible momentum you've just spent an hour listening to. So why don't I start with Dan um, and, and Tony. Um, Dan, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, what you all are thinking and how this might be an inspiration for others on the council um, in thinking about how they can push some of these ideas in their respective communities? Um, sure, yeah, Tony and Sarah, uh, and I had a, a good conversation uh, recently about um, ways that we can engage the, the private sector uh, in this work. Um, I'm of a firm belief that, that we, we need the buy-in and support um, of the business community if we're going to come anywhere close to accomplishing these uh, ambitious goals. And so we're, we're kind of in the nascent stages of putting together an outreach plan um, that I think should start with going out into the business communities, whether that's local chambers, rotary clubs, um, key employers in the state, uh, in, in listening, you know, 
uh, presenting the plan and, and listening. What are the needs of the business community and how can we help them um, through either you know, policy or, or other avenues uh, buy into this plan? And so um, uh, I, I would just say stay tuned uh, and I'll hand it over to, to, to Tony who might have a little bit more color to add. No, I, I think that's that's perfect, and it is in nascent stages. And I think you know the the timing is important. You know, one thing that Dan and I said, like if we had started outreach three months ago, it would have been a little bit more challenging. But now that we're getting into a little more certainty, both on um, uh, where we stand with some of the climate initiatives, especially around some of the funding and ARP and the budget, um, I have a lot more to talk about. Um, but also the opportunity to maybe do these in a, in a non-Zoom way, nothing against another Zoom room, but I think at, at this point, if we're going to start a new outreach initiative, if there's the opportunity to do it in small groups, do it in person, do it in a more variety of ways, um, I think we could capture some, some interest and some momentum just to, to, to do things maybe um, in an old-fashioned way, you know, in a Rotary Club or a, a Chamber of Commerce or a business breakfast. Um, and also fill a programming need for some of those things as they start to, to ramp up maybe later this year. So uh, Dan and I can continue to work on this, put together a plan um, to, start, uh, to start having this outreach. And I think Dan's point too is really important about listening. Um, we have a lot that we could bring forward. There's a lot of good initiatives that we, could, that we could advertise. We have a great plan to talk about. But I think if we frame this as um, listening to needs and interpreting needs and being able to, to meet businesses where they are and understand what their needs are now um, is really important. And so uh, this fulfills, there's a, a, a reference to a, a Climate Leadership Council and Strategy H. This fulfills that, that mission. But I think you know, what that Leadership Council was envisioned when we talked about it in the plan coming out versus what it could be now is different. And so we'll do some listening and we'll do some outreach and we'll figure out the right way to make it happen. So this is just one example of the kind of work that we're going to do and where the support from the, the, the vendor or consultant from the RFP is going to be really helpful to help sustain it. So I'm looking forward to getting started. Great. Okay. Thanks. That's really interesting um, in a, a sort of a teaser of what's possible uh, when we put our minds to it and start thinking about engaging different publics. Okay, we're gonna do something to lift up all of your voices of all the 30 something uh, climate counselors that are on the call right now. I'm gonna ask my colleague Cameron, who's with us to send just to panelists, not to attendees this time, but just to panelists. And, and thanks those of you who are listening in, we'll show you the results of this. We're gonna do two quick questions and see how the results shape up. So Cameron, if you can drop in the chat, there you go, to the panelists. If you click on this link, it'll say Menti on it. You see that? If you click on that link, it's going to prompt you to type a response to the following question, right? The first of two questions is this. How do you sense the Climate Action Plan is resonating in Maine today? This is for like a very short phrase, like not too many, not too many characters on this, so we can see it. We're going to watch how these answers come in. If you can just go ahead and submit an answer, how do you think? How do you sense the climate action plan is resonating today in Maine? And what Cameron's going to do is he'll start to share his screen with the results that are coming in. All right, you'll see the second question there on the screen right now. We're going to go to that in a second. All right, so go ahead and answer that first question, hit submit. Cameron's going to get the results page loaded up on his machine and we'll see what everybody's saying. It's a quick sort of gut check. How do we think this is playing in the state right now? Okay, you should be able to see in your screen now what people are saying. Right, guarded optimism, gaining momentum, still but unknown, right? Very well. A lot of interest and support from stakeholders. Great. Finally, thank God. Yes, that's a good one. Right, so we're just looking at this coming in. I wanted to get a flavor. It's a quick way to look at all 35 of you, whoever on the 37 that are on the call right now. And we'll talk about this in just a sec. Great, okay. Great to have funding. 
gaining momentum with uncertainty. Okay, so this is what I'm going to suggest. Cameron, why don't we quickly go to the next question, then we'll open it up for some conversation around this. So um, if you click on that link again, Cameron can advance you to the next question. It just let's say go to the next slide. Go ahead and click on go to next slide if that if it prompts you. And you should have a second question. How can I help communicate and engage Mainers around this plan? Dan, Kleban, and Tony told you about what they're thinking of doing. What do you want to do? And let's go ahead and take a moment, think about this. What do you want to do around this? Let me know if you're having any, I'll host the Dan and Tony show. Sounds great. Let me know if anybody's having a hard time clicking through to these links or didn't advance to the next question. I know it's kind of confusing sometimes. I've already sent you over to a Google doc as well. Here we go. I see stuff coming in. Great. Great, so you can see what's coming in. Um, I goofed in not having you put your name in there. I should have <laughs> referenced that. But this is something where we can start a conversation around this as well. I'm looking at what's coming in, right? Share messaging, feedback and information sharing, engage a person um, in person, a summary of what has happened, continue to show action, partner with industry, right? You, a lot of stuff's coming through. So let's keep this on the screen for just a second. And now I'm just going to open up the mics for everybody. And when you wrote this, you know, I'm interested in people's reactions when they when I asked you to write this. If people want to just open up their mics or raise your hand and Zoom, um, let's get a quick conversation about what really is going to make the difference, you think, in the coming months and year um, around engaging people and around communicating these plans. Um, anybody want to share? Go ahead and raise your hand or just unmute yourself if you're having a hard time to raise hand. Zoom seems to keep changing it. Any reactions when, about what you wrote or what you're seeing others write? Such a, such a shy climate council this morning. <laughs> I think we sort of like overwhelmed them with an hour and 15 minutes of updates. What's in your minds, folks? What's going through your heads when you're thinking about engagement and communication around this climate plan? David, it, it's Sandy. Um, I, I just think the more success stories we can tell, uh, the more we can show connection between uh, the, the goals of Maine Won't Wait, what's getting implemented, where policy uh, is sort of being developed, uh, how citizens can get engaged with either writing in or testifying, any any way to uh, show people that we're succeeding, we're making some progress. I'm amazed by how much progress has been made. I don't know how people have figured out a, the 36 hour day, but it seems like people have definitely done that. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, things are happening. Progress is being made. How do you share that? Let's um, let's go ahead and drop the screen share for for now, Cameron. Thanks, and let's just have a conversation about all this. What really is in people's minds when you think about, and particularly the role of you all as a council going forward, um, what, what would you like to be doing? What do you think it's important you do collectively as a council? Kate, want to go ahead? Because I'm such so shy myself. Um, exactly. You know, I saw a lot of comments that resonated with me in the last conversation that um, Tony and Dan queued up. I, I think that there, as Sandy said, there is so much excitement. One of the comments I put on the our questionnaire form was, I think back in December, all of us were pretty nervous about you know, the trajectory of a lot of things. And 
in particular money, right? We were really nervous about how do we fund this um, strategy. And so one curiosity I have, I think not, but that I put in the questionnaire was, uh, is there something we might have done back in December with now knowing what is possible? What I've been really impressed with was, is um, the agency staff really tying these federal funds, working with the governor's office to tie the funds to the recommendations. I think that has come really um, out clearly through this conversation. And, um, you know, a lot of comments of we need to show people in every community. I loved Joyce's conversation about rural transportation, of course, and showing people that change is possible just helps build momentum. So I guess my curiosity to all of us is, you know, do we, those of us in maybe the NGO community or the philanthropic or union community do a better job of connecting the dots in everything we say? So it's kind of a, maybe it's an obvious question, but I think the more we think of ourselves as a network across the state, and have a common kind of thing we all say, like this is a result of dot, dot, dot. Um, it's just people hear things from different sources and it becomes more trusted and um, they see themselves in the picture. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, Representative Bloom, you still haven't been pulled into session, I see, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not on video, but I'm sitting here in the Civic Center. I, I just I just think there's such genuine enthusiasm and excitement about how this process has all worked out. And I and I think that we really have to have to share this with the main people that they can be really proud of what has happened with this plan and where we're at and how thoughtful and how um, how many what experienced people we have. I'm just blown away by hearing about all of the things that are happening on the administrative level, level the interdepartmental work, the collaboration. It's, it's exactly what needs to be done. It's a real example for the rest of the country, how well we've done. And I, I'm, I'm so, in, I, I just feel like spreading that enthusiasm through letters to the editor through meeting, well, from my perspective, I can meet with my constituents and tell them about what's happened in the last legislative session, including the Maine Climate Council. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm overjoyed and, and so excited and enthusiastic. I, 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 that's the kind of thing that I want to be able to, um, to, to put forth, to, make, to show that yes, there is hope, because of the good people of Maine and the work that they have done. Thanks, Lydia, that's really inspirational. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, are there anything, are there other things that come to mind that people wanna say um, before we close up today in today's meeting? David, this is, uh, this is Ivan. Um, yeah. I just wanted to uh, uh, compliment the, the uh, documentation for today that did a really nice job of, I mean, there's so many moving parts, even if you're peripherally involved in some uh, some way, it's hard to keep track of what's going on and what's related, particularly to the, the, the framework of the eight strategies. And so the uh, the new funding proposals summary does a really nice job of, of putting the package together and, and walking through it today, I think, uh, you know, uh, is informative. I think going forward, uh, keeping that kind of framework, but also then having, uh, you know, human interest stories uh, of how this is now being implemented uh, on all corners of the state uh, to to uh, for all of us to be able to understand uh, and be able to see the, the the change that's taking place, the the transformation that is under uh, underway, and and the, the positive outcomes for it. So, kudos on the report today and. I think that's the beginning of, a, of a ongoing information that's really important to tell the story of what's happening with the action plan. Thanks, Thanks Ivan. That's great. Yeah, that sort of human interest piece is gonna be more and more important. And we've had it in the report, right? You remember some of those great anecdotes and stories in the report and to keep that going. Yeah. 
Ken? Um, I'll just reinforce the earlier commenters. Uh, in, in your question, David, what should we do now? I think the answer is keep going. Um, it, this reminds me of the situation of the, uh, there's an old saying, what something like good fortune is where preparation meets opportunity. And we did a lot of preparation in the, in the development of the report and, and certainly STS's work in uh, putting us in a good position for that. And, uh, and, and, and then the advent of the federal money solves a lot of the problems. So here we are feeling like Sally Field at the Oscars. We, we have the money and we have the public reception. You like me, really? Yes, uh, it seems like uh, there's a lot going for us and what we need to do is, is keep going. And indeed the science dictates that we don't have any time left so we need to keep going. So uh, this is just a wonderful situation and we shouldn't take the foot off the gas. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Ken. Okay, any last thoughts before Hannah um, gives us a heads up what's coming in next step? Michael's daughter's got his oh. hand up. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I just wanna pick up on what um, Ken was saying, which is in addition to keeping going, I you know, we're running a marathon here. This is gonna be a long, long haul. And we're right at the early stages, I would say, where we're feeling pretty good. And uh, we've made it through the first mile or two and we got some wind at our back and we should definitely keep that up. But I also think we should run this race knowing that we're in it for the long haul. So we've got all these good ideas and we're fortunate to have some funds. I think we really got to, sort of bear down through this next period of time and really try to do a good job of implementing on the mandates that we've been given and the funds we've been giving. And, and that's, I happen to work at one place among many that where that's the day job is doing the work of, of implementing. And so when you ask, what is it that we can all do in this group? I think it's keep working hard to, to make sure that the implementation is successful and that we can continue telling a positive narrative about how this works for people and how it makes life better living in Maine and makes the economy better. And, um, and so, cause I think we need to really leverage this moment and all the momentum we have for some longer haul stuff. These federal funds won't last till 2030. They're going to last us a couple few years. So we need to take, we need to think about how we expend them and how we implement these programs. So we have set ourselves up for such a positive story that the next crop of policymakers just can't resist continuing uh, and sustaining the direction we're taking and the mom and, and the momentum we're building. So that's what I think is going to be the, the task for the next year or two. Thanks, Michael. Yep really important. Hannah, what comes next? Yeah, no, I, I would just wrap it up and um, thank you all for, for coming. I will say, uh, I think Michael's comments are very, very apt. Um, I know everybody in their volunteer and day jobs is, is doing this work or connected to this work in some way. I will say, you know, especially for many of the agency folks and commissioners, it's it's a it's a wild time, and we are still, you know, I'm looking at Major General Farnham and the work of MEMA and all the work that's happening to still battle the end of this pandemic. It's really it's been a pretty Herculean year, but I think doing the work well, and I think the council really staying engaged in how we do the work well is important. Um, we we only sort of briefly touched on, you know, as we come out of this pandemic. We have huge opportunities with our workforce and there's a lot of clean energy components to that. But I just think the sort of rebuilding time period, how we thoughtfully kind of build the foundation that Michael just spoke of for the long term, I think is, is a big, big deal. Um, so I will just say um, we really appreciate your hour and a half. Um, please stay in touch. Everything we talked about today is actually still in the, I don't want to say aspirational, but need to be finalized stage. Um, we need to get these things across the finish line in the legislature. Um, we need to get them across the finish line eventually in Washington. That, that's kind of part two of really doing this work successfully. So um, I know you all probably understand those processes as well as we do. So um, we do look forward to September. We'll, we're going to do a little more thinking about that fall meeting, um, but I, I hope we have a little more time to dig in and kind of 
uh, think with all of you about the next steps of the of the long term building because I think we're now in the uh, I don't even, I, I don't know what analogy to properly use about where we are today but um, again I, we feel really positive but but lots of work ahead so again thank you all for for bearing with us and we will see you at our September meeting forgot the exact date but I know Cassie will put it on the radar screen excellent there it is <laughs> there it is. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Um, take care. We'll send around notes so people have the, a record of all these nice things you said um, and look forward to catching up in the fall. All the best. Take care.